Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Colony Drop, a Gundam podcast. My name is Brian. And my name is Isaac. This is your favorite Gundam podcast, where we talk about all the Gundam things you love, like Gunpla, series, OVAs, movies, the music, like the opening and exit songs, and really anything related to the Gundam lore. Isn't that right, Brian? That is right, Isaac. And today, we're talking about Gundam tropes, Isaac. Ah, tropes, 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 tropes. Brian, since we're just little consumers drones, we're intimately familiar with what tropes are. But for people who maybe, I don't know, they got a bit of the COVID and they don't remember much anymore, what is a trope? (laughs) (laughs) I think it kind of depends on what context you're using trope. Because the the dictionary defines trope as a figurative or metaphorical use of a word or expression. But I don't think that's really what TV tropes are. Is that fair? I mean, yeah. when I think of trope, I think most people use it in the way that this website called TV Tropes or or similar websites collect popular plot devices or or popular plot concepts across many works. And they give them a, a funny name, right? Is that that's kind of what I would consider to be the more common definition of a trope. Exactly. I would be even less nice than that and say a trope is really a cliche. It's something we see often in movies or shows or, or you know, novel stories, really anything. These sort of repeating situations or archetypes, things like that, that become instantly familiar to us and we know exactly what they are. You know, it could be like um, a sci fi setting where, of course, there's the evil empire, right? Oh, the evil empire. <laughs> Who's fighting them? It's, of course, you know, the, the freedom loving, plucky alliance. Oh, they're a bunch of underdogs, right, Brian? <laughs> things like that. That stuff, though, you know, you, you pop in a new game, turn on some, uh, some streaming app, and you, you boot up the sci fi. And you instantly know the people in the black and red uniforms are bad, <laughs> right? And that's then the right, ones in right. like you know the bright colors that talk about like freedom and democracy, they're probably the good guys. <laughs> the, the whites and the blues and the yellows, yeah. Those are very much tropes in our pop culture, at least here in the West, that we um, we instantly recognize and identify. So we're going to talk about maybe the top five tropes that we'd like to see changed in Gundam, but also just general tropes that we we recognize, Brian. Is that right? Is that what we're generally going to do? Yeah, exactly. So one thing there, I think it's important that you mentioned the word cliche because I think a lot of times tropes, it sort of has a negative connotation, right? If you say, oh, well, it's just that trope or it's just this trope. It's very dismissive of your story, right? That's sort of generic. Yeah. So yeah, we're going to go over our top five that we thought of independently. And then we're going to do a lightning round, Isaac, where we just go down as many of the the tropes listed for the Mobile Suit Gundam franchise on the TV Tropes website and see your reaction as to whether you think they're a problem. And if they are (laughs) a problem, how you would fix it. Yeah. And let's just clarify before we start. There's some tropes that are specific to Gundam. Like it's something we see in multiple Gundam series and movies and stories. It's as iconic as like to Gundam as a lightsaber is in Star Wars. So there's no getting away from it. We're going to run into it. So we're going to talk about some of those tropes also. (laughs) All right, Isaac, hit me with your number, with your, uh, with your first trope. Okay, Brian, this is something that I've mentioned has been, I guess I'd call it a pet peeve. And I really hope the listeners can back me up on this. It's a coin flip, whether you see it, it's that frequent. And I'm going to say it right now. It's the protagonist falls into the cockpit. Oh, the protagonist falls into the cockpit, right? There's a battle or something's going on. The colony's on fire. The base is on fire. And who falls into the cockpit? Joe protagonist. (laughs) And it's up to them to, you know, suddenly from now on, learn this Gundam and fight for freedom and take down the, the bad guys. It's become almost an annoyance, you know, whenever I see some, usually a teenager, fall into the cockpit mid-battle, get thrown into the cockpit, or in a serendipitous coincidence, being the only person in a military hangar bay and then (laughs) being able to run over to like the open cockpit and take control of it to like, you know, fight to protect his his friends and family. Are you talking (laughs) directly to Ko Uraki with that last (laughs) statement? A little bit, yeah, yeah. I wonder how different things would have been if like Lieutenant Burning got to unit one first, right? Like he might have he might have given Gato a run for his money. We'll never right, know. Right, yeah. But yeah, Banajer Links, of course Amuro Ray, Kira Yamato. This stuff happens almost every other series, if not the majority of series, Brian. And uh, I'm gonna say it. I'm a little sick of it. One of the strongest parts of the eighth MS team is that this doesn't happen. They're just a military unit on a mission. 
I, it's something I really appreciate and I enjoy when I don't see the protagonist fall into the cockpit. Brian, I've talked long enough. What do you <laughs> think about protagonists falling into the Gundam cockpit? Yes, this trope is on my list as well. It's probably one of the first ones I thought of. This one's also on TV tropes. They call it falling into the cockpit. And, <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, you're right. I think it works once or twice. But then if you do it every time or too many times, it's it's repetitive. And kind of like you said, there's a, there's layers to this, right? So Amuro falling into the cockpit, that's the original series. You get away with that. When Kira does it, you kind of lean on the fact that, like, okay, they're just recreating the original. It's an homage. But <laughs> Wasn't Ramius also in the cockpit with him? And, he, like, she was, she's a yeah. trained officer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, like, when Banajer does it, for example, I did not like that. I thought that was... Like, I was like, ah, oh, this is this is too on it, the nose. And, like, we learn yeah, a little it, bit later that maybe, you know, he was a little closer to the unicorn than perhaps you think in the first episode. But Yeah, like, I'd put, like, an asterisk next to Benadjer because yeah. he was sort of thrown into the cockpit. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, maybe that's fair. In his defense, like, he, he probably would have got in if no one was there and the situation kept deteriorating, but... Yeah, in his defense, he was thrown in by somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like you said, they try to get away with it in other series, like with Ko, for example. He didn't fall into the cockpit, but the situation was very similar. So this is very similar to another trope on TV tropes called Ensign Newbie, where like you know the new the new person with no experience gets the best unit or is put in charge of everyone. <laughs> yeah, sort of falls along the same thing. Like you're saying, you know, like why didn't they just give burning? Uh, the suit you know like why didn't they give burning the suit right after the first battle like just because co-piloted it once doesn't mean that he has to keep piloting it right yeah and like how adamant how how stubborn was burning where well i'm gonna pilot my suit and you know (laughs) i'm not gonna take the prototype like i'm surprised nina didn't take him aside and say look you're the only ranking officer that can pilot a mobile suit right you should probably take the gun (laughs) (laughs) So how would you fix this, Isaac? I would say, you know, at the Sunrise Committee meeting that, you know (laughs) what? We're not doing this anymore. From now on, you could have a transfer pilot you know, who's new to the to the unit and he's going to get a Gundam. You can have a, a squadron being upgraded to Gundams, wh- whatever way you're going to do it. But from now on, nobody is falling into a cockpit. If you still want to keep, you know, the whole teenager protagonist, you can have somebody maybe raised and studied and gone to an academy specifically right. for Gundams and then gets assigned a Gundam, you know, in episode one, but no more falling into cockpits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. So I, the other other ways I thought of was like if you if if this was like a school setting or a class setting, you know, it could be a competition, and whoever wins, you know, gets to use it, and proves that they're the best. That would be one way. Yeah, uh, you could have people on the team switch off in the Gundam over time. You know, maybe some people are better at uh, shooting, and others are better at hand to hand combat, or you know, That's long range brilliant. sniping. You know, they they could switch off depending on what they were doing or something like that. So yeah, some people die. Yeah, yeah. A good example was Mika, right, in Iron Blooded Orphans. He was the one that used the Gundam because he was the one that could use it, right, with with his level of Aliyah Vinyana that he had. Yeah, even though it hurts him. But no one else really on the team could use it as effectively as he could. So he had a real reason that he was in the cockpit. He didn't just jump in. Yeah, but he's human debris. And as we all know, <laughs> I can't stand human debris. <laughs> <laughs> I won't even be in the same room. All right. <laughs> I just got standards, goddammit. Yeah, I just can't stand it. All right. <laughs> so, yes, I, listeners, let us know what you think about protagonists falling into the cockpit. I'd really be surprised if the listeners, you know, or e- even a few listeners are like, oh, I, it better be it fall into the cockpit every every season, you know, every series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you don't see that, do you get upset? Because I, I don't know. I, when Now when I see it, I'm just like, ah, here we go with the falling in the cockpit. Like. <laughs> it's kind of a wink and a nod to the old stuff, but like too, maybe too many winks and nods at this point. Yeah, and especially with you, Brian, and your constant <clears throat> critique that like there is no security around the Gundam cockpit. Like the 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 <laughs> user design has been you know it's been built around open access completely. <laughs> you you can access that thing with the push of a button. You know, no keys, yes. no locks, no combination or password or keypad, anything like that. No biometric. You yep. just hop in the cockpit and you're now in control of one of the most powerful weapons in the in the universe. Yeah, they could at least show people, you know, using the the, the Slim Jim to like open the door that was a Slim Jim. <laughs> 
Yeah, you know the things that people use to steal cars. You, you yeah, it's yeah. like a little piece of metal you stick in your car door. At least on older cars, I don't think you can do it now. But a, a bunch of Xeon operatives using like a credit card to like <laughs> yeah. slide down the side of the cockpit and pop it open. <laughs> <laughs> that would be more secure than what we have today, is what I'm saying. So <laughs> true, true. Okay, okay. Let us know what you think, listeners, about falling into the cockpit. All right, moving on. Number two. Uh, why don't we? You want to switch to you, Brian? See what you got on your list. Uh, sure. So another top one for me is the mid-season upgrade, Isaac. Oh, interesting. Okay. So this is where the protagonist, you know, either destroys or gets his suit severely damaged by the midpoint of the season, and right. he is either given or gifted or otherwise finds a, you know, very conveniently, a brand new mobile suit that's much better than the one he just wrecked and is now going to be, like, the best suit in the back half of the show. I think at this point it can be a little too convenient or forced, and, you know, it's also a great way to sell more Gunpla, so I totally understand why they do it. But it's almost to the extent now, Isaac, where you, where it's expected too much. It's no longer a surprise. And right. I think that's what kind of ruins it for me. Yeah. And I, I, I thought about putting on this on my, putting this on my list, but d- did you prepare a possible remedy to this trope or a I way did. to freshen? I did. Okay, let's hear it. So one way to get around it is you could gradually upgrade the same unit. So this would be similar to Iron-Blooded Orphans. Whereas okay. the base unit, yeah, it gets damaged, but every time you repair it, you upgrade it a little bit here to there, you make it different. That saves you from having to do the whole replacement. Like a, a quarterly upgrade, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, f- three times throughout the season. Okay. And then it grows with the character, right? You know, and it's like having battle scars the whole time. Interesting. Okay. Another way to do it would be to make, and this might not be palatable from a plot perspective, but you could make the Gundam the mid-season upgrade. Maybe the whole time they're trying to get the Gundam or working up to the, you know, getting the Gundam, and then they finally get it, and now they have like the, the big bad power. So clever. People might not want to wait that long. Um, hmm. So I, I could see that, but I mean, they kind of did that in Zeta Gundam. Zeta took a little while to appear, right? They were using the Mark II yeah. for a while. It wasn't mid-season. That that would that's a little later, but. There's a, a little delay is what I'm saying could be good. Interesting. Okay, yeah. I thought about, you know, instead of doing mid, they do, I don't know, three quarters or f- finale battle upgrade, whatever, you know. Yeah. But, but then I was thinking about it a little deeper and I was like, what if it was interesting if there was no upgrade? Like it just kind of became like downgrade almost. So it's mm-hmm. more challenging for the protagonists and the heroes as they move on throughout the series. So yeah. that, that might work from an angle, but at the same time, you know, some people might roll their eyes and say, that's, that's a stupid, they might, yeah, they might hum and car me. And that's the stupidest <laughs> thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> that Gundam gets weaker as the series goes on. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's sort of true in, in the first series, but it, it was counterbalanced by Amro getting better. They had to code it with the magnetic coating to make it move faster to keep up. So it, it was still a good suit at the end though. Yeah. Okay. Food for thought. All right. Next trope, Isaac. Okay. Uh, this shouldn't surprise anybody, especially you, Brian, because <laughs> you know what a what a zombieist I am. <laughs> but I am largely done with every new series seeing a shark clone. Mm. Either the mask, the red mobile suit, usually a combination of the two. It just kind of makes me cringe and roll my eyes, especially in situations where like there's no reason for the person to be wearing a mask. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> We're running out of excuses for masks, people. Yeah, and I know villain Mc, McSkeamy has to uh, have a, an identifiable mobile suit, but does it have to be red all the time? Does it have to be crimson? Can, there's so many other colors that are you know interesting and can be used to paint a mobile suit from head to toe, and they'd be visually striking, but once again, it's always red. So, yes, I I would like a change, a divergence away from just seeing a shark clone every new series. (laughs) So this is actually one of the uh, tropes that Gundam named the trope for, and it's called the shark clone. There's another trope called XB, and that's when you export one character from one series to another, which is so the, the character in the other series is clearly based on the one from the old one. And so Char is like the best example of that because we see him in every series, right? Absolutely. They did control C and then just <laughs> copy and pasted him to so many Gundam series. Like, it, it, just move away. Just make new characters. There's only one Char. No one can ever really beat him. Just just give us new ones, new villains. 
Yeah, and they have this nice little collage of all the shark clones on TV tropes. It's pretty funny. This one's also on my list, Isaac. I mean, do you see any remedies here? I mean, I, I agree. I think it's a little bit... It's no longer surprising. Right. So it, it, maybe it's too expected. I, the only thing I can think of is either you have him turn out to be the hero. Maybe he switches places with the, with the protagonist. Maybe your protagonist at the beginning becomes the bad guy at the end and the masked guy becomes the good guy. Or, or make him the main character, and that could be different. You know, maybe we see it from his perspective, his or her perspective. For example, Isaac, what if, you know, in McGillis's case, what if his plan had worked? Would he have been the hero? Yeah. <laughs> he would have been the one that took down Gallahorn. I don't know if he would have instituted some form of democracy, but he at least would have dethroned their little, you know, evil yeah. underhanded empire that we saw doing so many problems throughout the series. So, yes, he would have won some hero points. Things didn't work out that way for him, unfortunately. But, but yeah, it's every time you see you're watching Gundam and you see a character with a mask, you know they're up to no good. You know they're the shark clone, and they're somehow got some some scheme cooking that's only going to unveil itself in like the final episode, killing a bunch of people. Yeah, I think you got to switch their allegiance or or make them win or or something to change it up if you're going to keep doing the masked villain. Yeah, if you drop the mask itself. Like maybe we're not saying get rid of like a rival pilot, you know, we're not saying get rid of somebody that clearly has a political intrigue or a plot going on. But if you drop the mask, that goes so far in just keeping us guessing, you know, almost until the last minute at someone's motives. Like it would be really ambushing the audience like, oh, my God, this person was planning this the whole time. Of course, you know, (laughs) if if only he had a mask, we would have known that he was sufficient. (laughs) Yeah, listeners, I want to hear your ideas for credible reasons why people should wear masks to the to the extent that these masked char- shark clones do yeah make up reasons to, to for him to wear these big masks even from what i've seen from individuals who are in combat and perhaps have some scarring on their face either a greater amount or a lesser amount they don't wear masks in public right because uh, largely we're all adults in civil society and we have a respect for the military and we just kind of, you know, th- that's just how it is. Right. You know, there's yeah. no need to comment about someone's scars or anything like that. Nobody just wears a mask and goes <laughs> around. Wearing a mask would attract more attention to you. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Maybe we're just not noble enough. These shark clones, they have a higher sense of uh, nobility, I guess. I guess, yeah. Zeon had such a, well, I guess Zaft had such a uh, an appearance based uh, culture that you <laughs> you dare not show scars in public or anything. Like that. <laughs> okay, Brian, what's next on your list? My next trope is the Gundam colors, Isaac. So the red, Ooh. Uh, the blue, the white, the yellow. So I think Interesting. that we've had too many Gundams in those in those colors, and I get why they do it. I mean, those are the heroic colors traditionally. Those are the heroic colors. I'm not saying that they're, they're bad. I just think that it would be nice if we had some that took a little bit different of approach. I mean, other you know, there are people like you and others that like maybe other colors better. And so if they designed a, a Gundam in those colors, you'd be more willing to like like the Gundam in that show versus maybe liking the bad guys, right? Yeah. I'm trying to think of what Gundam series we've had where they strayed from those colors for the main they Gundam. I, I, I'm the only... I, I'm astray the manga series <laughs> yeah well that but, i don't think that counts <laughs> yeah but like that's that's not so much a gundam as it is a type of mass-produced gundam <laughs> so. right right yeah and there's another angle here they, they always want to keep it on brand right the gundams look a certain way and they want to preserve that so that you know that it's a gundam and maybe not something from another show but the easiest thing i can think of to fix this is to simply just flip the dominance between blue and white And you would end up with the Titans color scheme, which is always good. I don't know anyone who doesn't like the Titans color schemes, but it gives the Gundam a whole nother feel. Yeah, but like, is that the feel? Well, I I guess it depends on the characters and and also the plot. You know, maybe they maybe they stole a Gundam that was purposely painted to be intimidating. Right. Um, (laughs) But it is a bit of an intimidating color scheme. Um, It is. Yeah. But damn, if it doesn't look cool, Isaac. Very authoritarian police. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or if you don't want to do that, at least, you know, you can do white, but just maybe do some green. Yeah. New Gundam. New Gundam's really, yeah. th- that's kind of its own category because how great it looked and there's not a drop of blue on it to my knowledge, right? 
Yeah, that's a good point. That's the only one. Uh, Alex that I had almost think of. too much blue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I like the Alex. I thought that was a good one. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, same sort of basic color scheme, right? I mean, there was more blue. True, true. Okay, I'm with you there, Brian. Yeah, let's. Yeah. If you're on the Gundam like coloring team for each series, like you, you probably kind of roll your eyes and like, well, I, I guess I get her get the blue coloring and <laughs> the yellow and the white. Here we go. <laughs> I'm not saying that every Gundam from here on out should be a different color. I'm just saying like one series where they switch it up, I think would go a long way. Yeah, new worked. Other other colors worked. Just give it a try for the main one. We'll be okay. Take risks. You know. There you go. Yeah. Oh, listeners, let us know what color Gundam you'd like to see. Yeah. You know, as the main one, not you know, like the side character or supporting Gundam, but right. like the main one that appears in the opening title. Right. <laughs> and it can't be white, blue, yellow with a little bit of red. All right, it's got to be something else. <laughs> and some yellow vents. Yeah. I don't want to hear any of those colors in your comment. <laughs> All right, Isaac. What's your next trope? Okay. Brian might open fire on me for this, but I'm going to say it anyways. And this applies maybe mainly to the UC, but also other series. We have fallen into sort of a, a, a super weapon attack trap. Wow. Yeah. Let, let, let me explain myself. Every time we're told a colony is about to fall, an asteroid is about to fall, we're told that this is the last one. After this, the <laughs> Earth will be uninhabitable. And what happens years later? The planet's booming. The Earth Federation government's <laughs> fine as usual because they're like cockroaches. They're just indestructible. They keep the government running no matter what's happening. <laughs> and yeah, for, so for that reason, the dropping trope, the colony dropping trope, mm. we need to just, in UC especially, just take a break dropping things. All right, we're not going to do that anymore because the Earth has been through like 10 drops and it's still there. So whoever's doing this dropping really needs to like sit down and say, we're not even going to try it because it's not going to do anything. You know, maybe we'll, yeah, put your money, put your eggs into like the energy weapon basket, you know, or something like that. But dropping mass objects, whether asteroids or colonies, it's over. We know it doesn't work. We know the Earth's environment is very robust very rugged and very uh, uh resilient so <laughs> please stop please we'll, we'll transition to other attacks brian i know our <laughs> podcast is called colony drop but <laughs> please tell me you somewhat agree with me <laughs> well i think they keep doing it because it's cheap you know they can just go get this big hunk of thing and just send it down they don't have to do much else but it doesn't work if it was cheap and worked it would make sense <laughs> but it doesn't work <laughs> I mean, it works to some extent, but I, I agree. I, I think especially in the first UC century, they've dropped enough colonies and we don't really have room to drop anymore. What about if there was a new story, Isaac, and they were attempting a colony drop and it was foiled? Is that acceptable or is just the, the, the very nature of attempting the colony drop is what you don't like? I'd be more okay with that because it sounds like it'd be a pretty epic space battle, right? Stopping yeah. the colony. Yeah. But if the series had a successful drop and like yeah. the Earth Federation was still up and running, I'd be like, well, uh, these space fascists are idiots because they should have just opened up a history book and said, this drop operation isn't going to work at all. We need to build some type of other weapon that's actually going to get us what we want. Yeah, because I think I'm there with you in the sense that, so how many drops have we had that were successful? There was the original one, there was one in Double Eighty Three, uh, the one in Double Zeta, and then the asteroid drop in charge counterattack. So that's four within 15 years of each other. Right. So I agree that that's about the limit to where the believability of the danger is intact, right? If you continue to do more, then I think what you're saying is correct. Yeah, it's just they're great to watch. They're great to enjoy. And even uh, the cosmic era with the the drop of um, the ruins of, um, what was it, Junior 7? Yeah. That was great, too. It, it's just After War X, that was very great. But, mm -hmm. oh, my God, After War X kind of proves my point. Um, <laughs> because they <laughs> dropped dozens of colonies and Earth was still intact. They, their government came back like 15, 20 years later and rebuild itself. I don't think it was a pleasant time, though. I, I think it was no, pretty rough. But, 
<laughs> that's not my point. Like each time Char or whoever in Neo Zeon, whatever, they're about to like do their their drop. They're like, ah, this will be it. You know, it'll be permanent yeah. nuclear winter, and then we'll we'll defeat the Earth Federation in, in one swoop. But no, <laughs> it won't happen that way. You you might kill like you know a few million people, but the the government's just gonna come back and as usual use all the Earth's resources and population to defeat whatever space noids rallied against them so let's take a break on dropping things let's focus on like really cool exotic super weapons you know who doesn't believe you isaac Uh oh is the mars zeon because they're all about their olympus mons cannon <laughs> in their defense and i give them a little bit of a break they were like a group of pilots that like ran away <laughs> As, as we saw when they fired their weapon and it like caused their base to slowly destroy itself. They didn't quite have the engineering skills to really calculate that they could wipe out the Earth. So yeah. they, they meant their best, but like their weapon was blocked by a single capital ship, <laughs> right? It was like a clop, I think, or something like that, right? Yeah, it was uh, an, an unimpressive capital ship. Yeah, and it just got in the way of the big meteor thing that they were lobbying and, and that was it. That's what stops their attack, a capital <laughs> ship. All right, Isaac, I have one more on my list. All right, Brian, lay it on us. All right, so this is what's on my list, and it has an actual name on TV Tropes. It's called the Smurfette Principle. The Smurfette Principle. Brian, explain to us what this (laughs) is. This is basically that every series has female pilots, but they're almost always outnumbered by male ones, and the, the main character is never the girl. Huh. In most series, we, we don't get a lot of females in Gundams, right? In Wing, right. we had uh, Lucrezia Noin, didn't get a Gundam. In X, we had Anil L, she didn't get her Gundam, even though there was one in the planning stage. In uh, Mobile Suit Gundam, you know, Sayla didn't get a Gundam. That's not really fair. We only really had one Gundam in the show. In Zeta, well, in Zeta, we had Emma in the Mark II, so that was good. So we need more of that, Isaac. I'm not saying every main character needs to be female, but there needs to be more females on the Gundam team in a Gundam. So, for example, Stellar from Seed Destiny, even though maybe maybe she's not my favorite character, but at least she was on the team and had a, and had a Gundam, right? Right, yeah. On Gundam team or A team, do you mean... Well, you just kind of answered me. I was about to say, not necessarily piloting the Gundam itself, because we're about to see that in Witch of Mercury, of course. Right. But being part of, like the core supporting Gundams, or even Correct. the core mobile suits, or just the core supporting Gundams? The core supporting Gundams. So, for example, okay. uh, Luna Maria is a great example, right? She's this sort of main cast member, but they gave her a Zaku. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I know she gets the impulse later on, but that's a hand-me-down. I don't count hand-me-downs. Huh. Okay. Give her one from the get-go, right? When Durandal is like, hey, Shin, hey, Ray, here's your two new Gundams. Why didn't he give one to Luna Maria? <laughs> <laughs> I think we all know why, because of the uh, the glass cockpit, shall we say? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she got smurfed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I completely agree with you, which is why the witch from Mercury looks like it's going to be so interesting, because we never, nine times out of ten, get a female lead, let alone one in its own full-fledged series. So, yeah, here we are, and it's going to be a heck of an adventure. And I read an article the other day that said, oh, you know, it was about Witch from Mercury. I forget what website it was on. <clears throat> but it said, oh, this is the second Gundam series with a female lead, the first being Christina McKenzie from 0080. And, like, I strongly disagree oh, with that. Mm. She was not the lead character. She was, like, a main character, but not the yeah. main character. The main character was Alfred. And then if I had to pick a pilot that was the main character, it was Bernie. And then Christina McKenzie. She wasn't in the show very much. No, she uh, she was a female pilot. We all know that, but right. not yeah. We're t- apples and oranges as far as compared to Witch from Mercury. Yes, you know, and also it's wrong any way you look at it. Though <laughs> the the amount of time between Christina and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Witch from Mercury. <laughs> it's like what was uh, so double or double eighty was probably what early nineties if I recall. So yeah, we're talking like thirty years here. Yeah. And we've only now put a woman in the cockpit. It's like, <laughs> what What the heck was going on over there? Like, who, did they look at, like, I don't know, their marketing data or something? And they're like, oh, we, we can't do it. You know, we'll alienate our, our main demographic, you know, young men. And it's like, well, I, is it really the end of the world if, <laughs> if there's a woman in the cockpit? The world has changed, and here we are. Yeah, I'm imagining they, you know, they want to cater to the main market, which, as you said, is probably young men, boys. 
that's fine if you only make one show every 10 years or whatever. But, it, you know, we get a Gundam show pretty frequently, especially back in the 90s and early 2000s. We, we haven't got a new show in a while, but... Yeah. You, you just take just take one of them every three years and, and throw the females a bone, and, you know, you, you might get a good result. You know, maybe you unlock a new fan base, so... And not to go off on this whole tangent of uh, gender and um, anime, Brian, but not... I, I've seen and enjoyed anime series where the main character was not a man. <laughs> right? How dare you, Isaac? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did I betray the team? Do I have to turn in my jacket? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I Take mean, off that patch. <laughs> yeah, like there's good anime where like the protagonist is a woman. I'm glad Gundam's finally turning the corner and we're going to be experiencing that. Yeah, I mean, there's so many reasons to do this. You, you could potentially unlock a new fan base. Yeah. You also just kind of want to defend your brand from this criticism, too. That's, like, not a good reason to do it, but it, it's a benefit, you know? You don't yeah. want people to look at Gundam and be like, oh, you guys are the guys that never have a female pilot. Like, what's, you know, what's wrong with you? Yeah, a woman's either an engineer, a captain far from the battle, or, like, maybe, like, a, a an Amazonian mechanic, you know? <laughs> <laughs> There's, like, th- those are the three roles. Yeah. But yeah, it also limits your story, right? Because as we've seen in Witch from Mercury, the villains seem to be uniformly men of authority and power. And yeah. her being, you know, referenced as a witch or whatever, or whatever bizarre religious laws and rules their their universe and setting has, it looks like a witch is the perfect protagonist to just break it all apart. <laughs> With the hammer of witches. With the hammer of witches. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do you have any more on your list before we go to the lightning round? I sure do. I have all right. two, and let me kind of combine them so we can get to the lightning round, if that's all right. Okay, yeah. Okay, my first one, and this will be surprising because I'm such a big Dagwin fan. <laughs> my first one is how we routinely have to fight space fascists. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I know that the fascism's terrible. It's bad. It should always be opposed in any form and in any time it takes place. But maybe we can have a variety of enemies we're facing. You know, there's different enemies to sort of the the general vague democracy that the, that the heroes are usually defending. You know, maybe they can yeah. be fighting a group of uh, of monarchists, you know, or um, mm-hmm. a, a group that's more sort of uh, some bizarre uh, utopian communism type branch or something like that, right? Or, or religious fanatics, you know, things like that. There's there's different avenues we can really take it. So seeing a bit more of that diversity instead of, you know, the, the Zeon stand-in, is, it would be uh, pretty interesting, I think. What do you think, Brian? Uh, I agree. Yeah, you definitely don't want to always fight the space fascist. I think it's it's good a few times. You can always go back to that well in the UC if you do the one year war timeline because that's what's happening at the time. But when you make a fresh story and you have the same sort of bad guy, it's a little redundant, or it makes the people who've already invested a lot in the old story not as interested because it feels a bit samey, right? If you're gonna right. do something new, you know, make, try to make it fresh. I guess. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And I hope we see that in future series moving forward now that we're hopefully um, in a phase where Gundam's going to be trying new ideas and uh, even experimenting a little bit. My final thing, Brian, is something that the Witch from Mercury will be addressing, and that it, well, maybe partially addressing, and that is how we are always stuck in the Earth sphere. Mm. You know, there's Luna, there's Earth, and then the colonies. This is great. But Gundam, I think, would do well being moved to a different setting, you know, maybe a different sphere, for all we know, a different galaxy or a different planet even, things like that. It worked pretty well in Iron-Blooded Orphans. It it wasn't holding it down that so much of the action took place on Mars. Yep. They should definitely go back to the drawing board and say, okay, Earth is great. Maybe it can be part of a story, but why don't we have the majority of the story take place in this other sphere or it can take place outside the solar system and give us a lot more uh, options for, you know, the setting we want and roles and characters, uh, factions, etc. cetera. Uh, that'd be a good breath of fresh air. I think. Yeah. I think they should keep pushing the envelope on that. I think they should keep trying to go further and maybe even create some, you know, brand new series where humanity has moved to another, you know, solar system somewhere. Um, it might be weird, but you know, we've got never done it before. So it could be fun. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Gundam does weird well. All right. Well, that wraps it up for me, Brian. Why don't we, why don't we uh, look up into the sky because it's time for the lightning round. All right. Cue lightning round sound effect. <laughs> the dog is scared. <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, he's retreated to the fireplace. He's hiding. Yeah. All right. So uh, there's way too many tropes on uh, TV tropes for Gundam. Uh, so we're just going to go over a few that I thought were maybe worth talking about. So the first one, Isaac, is called Aerith and Bob. And the description is there are some very strange named characters in Gundam. There are also a scattering of people with completely mundane names. If we listed every bizarre name in every series, will we be here all day? Do you feel that Gundam's variety of strange names is a problem? Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say so much for characters, but sometimes ships, <laughs> mm. <laughs> especially with Xeon, ships or mobile yeah. suits have just... The worst names, like like a bad AI invented them or something, you know, and like it's just consonants next to like bizarre groupings and then like a vowel, you know, it's, yeah. this might be a language gap a bit, you know, not that they're using Japanese words, obviously, but that perhaps their intended word in Japanese when they transplanted it into <laughs> English to become its own unique word, perhaps something was lost along the way. And that's why we end up with such bizarre sounding capital ships sometimes or mobile suits. I'm looking at you, Crossbone Vanguard. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> the hell's oh, a big Nagina? I mean, yeah, it's, it, it sounds like, uh, you yeah, know, it sounds anatomical. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm right with you there, Brian. That we need a bit of the word cleanup. <laughs> I'm okay. I, th- I think I'm on board with what you said. I think I don't. I don't 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 mind most of the names of the people, but yeah, sometimes they make the mobile suits and just the the mobile units just very difficult to to pronounce. Sometimes, uh, although you do hate C book, right? You thought that was like the worst name. Yeah, it it felt like such a crime. Like it, it's almost when you see his full name, it kind of feels like a misspelling, right? And it kind of bugs you. You know, <laughs> it almost seems like all they had to do was just flip the name. Just call him Arno Seabook, and we would have been like, okay, that sounds pretty reasonable as a full name, right? Yeah, I could see that. Instead, his insane parents decided to name him Seabook, <laughs> which is horrible. <laughs> All right, next trope. This one's called All There in the Manual. There are loads of supplements like side stories and model kit manuals. You won't miss vital information by ignoring them, usually. I'm bringing this one up because of a, a comment that a user left us. Uh, your name escapes me right now, but we will bring it up on the next uh, mailbag episode about how m- all the stuff that we talked about in 0083, Isaac, how much of that stuff was in, you know, not in the show. Right. I feel like Gundam has a lot of that in model kit manuals, in show Bibles that get published later on, in side stories that you just don't know. And that, that kind of is a little bit of a problem for for Gundam in the sense that those things are not very accessible to the normal fan. Yeah, it's like, you know, you, you hear about this whole variant of a mobile suit and it looks awesome. And you're like, well, why didn't we see this in the show? I'm like, oh, of course. It was in Sector 13, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, what? Come on. <laughs> you know, and like, oh, wow, well, look at this cool, uh, you know, attachment and mobile suit and upgrade kit. And like, oh, you didn't know about this. Well, this was from uh, this manga series that was never translated into English. But, you know, it's the, it's the reason that, you know, Kaisili had a firearm and, and killed uh, Giren. It's like, what? You know? <laughs> So yeah, I think it's a little bit of a problem. I think the way to fix it would just be to make those things more accessible. Put the side stories, translate them, and put them online for free or for a small cost. You have so much stuff. You're never going to sell it one by one. So just start getting yeah. it out there into people's minds. You just make, you know, let us consume it so that right. we f- further sink our teeth into your franchise instead of holding it back. Yeah, my dream would be that there's like a Bandai Plus, a Gundam Plus. Right. And what did yeah. they do? They got together, you know, small animation teams and they did all these side stories and mangas and little one shots and they just fleshed out their whole universe even more. Yeah. I agree. Or just make the manga available, you know, officially yeah. in, a, in an easily consumable format. So, Brian, they haven't translated series from like 20 to 30 years ago. I know. So. <laughs> And that's what I'm saying. I'm clearly they're not going to do it anytime soon. So if they're if if they're not doing it because they don't think they can profit on just that one thing, then try to profit it as a group. You know, 
can our computer science listeners, can you kind of like phone in on this? Like uh, maybe make a comment like, yeah, the AI is good enough now that it could read the Japanese and just swap out for <laughs> for English. You know, we just really need to scan the manga and we're good. You know, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying that even if there's not like a direct that, you know, Isaac didn't pay $5 for, for volume six of this, untra- you know, whatever manga. But there is value in the fact that Isaac spent time reading volume six. And now he's more willing to engage with your franchise going forward. So yeah. they have all this stuff on the shelf. I just think they should use it. Right, yeah. Or st- put it on streaming or something, because we know yeah. Isaac is not going to pay $5 yeah. for <laughs> yes. Volume 6. That's my point. <laughs> he's not going to do it. But if you give it all to him, he's going to be more willing to buy like the next big animation project that you put out. There you go, yeah. Or the next Gunpla. Or you the know. model. You know, you might buy a model kit from it, right? Absolutely. Oh yeah, you know me. I when if I spot something that's vaguely dom-like or sinister, <laughs> I usually jump at it. Yeah, if it's thick enough, you know, it goes on his wish list. So well, it's got bell bottoms. I need it. <laughs> uh, okay, the next two are kind of related. One is called alternative calendar, and one is called ambiguous time period. And this is basically speaking to the fact that Gundam all there's all these Gundam series, and they all take place sometime in this sort of ambiguous future time period, which is not really clear on how far in the future it is and the way they get around it is just by not addressing it and by giving you a different calendar i don't really see this as a problem i think that's just how they've chosen to tell the story and that's just a realistic constraint of telling a future story yeah i agree with that completely it would it would almost be interesting if like we got a gundam series where it was like you know it is the year 2532 and then you know we're like oh we're still in our century it's just we're so far ahead that they definitely can make changes to the setting or it, it's it's so unrecognizable from our setting, even though it's the same calendar system. They're just so far ahead. So, yeah, I, I completely agree. It's 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 always interesting and a different flavor when they give a new a new calendar system. But if they want to stick with ours and just make it further out, interesting also. All right. Next one. Armored coffins. Effective ejection systems are the exception rather than the rule in the franchise. In most instances, the pilot's best chance to survive is to pop the cockpit hatch and try to escape on foot, which is rarely an option while your mecha is exploding. <laughs> why Why is there no ejection system, Isaac? Um, it's almost as if the reactor and the fuel for the Gundam or the power is directly behind the cockpit. Yeah, it's in the way, right? Right, yeah. And so often in combat with the Gundams, they seem more fragile than fighter planes and bombers today where you presumably have enough time to eject and get out if the if it takes an indirect hit or you know even a glancing hit anything like that some engine trouble but yeah. with Gundam it looks like even a blast on the arm or the leg depending on how big it is it'll take out your reactor and you'll just explode in a flash yeah very volatile yeah it might be a case of well Either one or two things will happen when you're hit. You'll either be dead or you'll be wounded enough that you can keep fighting slash potentially open your cockpit and leave on your jetpack. <laughs> those jetpacks are pretty cool. I want one of those. Yeah. To an extent, the jetpack is the ejection seat, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, when you're when you're out there floating around, get to a capital ship, get to a friendly ship, or maybe, you know, ask someone in your squadron to pick you up if they're not in combat and you'll be okay. And by the way, core fighters don't count because there's like one out of every thousand suits that has a core fighter. So it's not it's not a realistic uh, option for most pilots. Yeah. And even even if you have a core fighter, you're not necessarily going to use it. Like it's very rare. Someone's take damage. Their mobile suit take damage. And then they're like, oh, I got to get out of here. And then they deploy the, clo- the core fighter. <laughs> That's not how it goes. <laughs> yeah. It, it happens too fast. Right. You need an automatic ejection system. So, yeah. All right, next one is called the Battle Star. Most warships have impressive firepower in addition to their mobile suit payload, which would be nice if they ever hit anything other than the mooks. And I think I agree with that, Isaac. The ships in Gundam, they don't perform that well. And I, to the, to the extent where I kind of wonder why they still make them. Yeah, it's mainly non-UC series that kind of sidestep this. And like when they send ships, they're pretty much just sending glorified carriers. Yeah. That has to be the only real reason, right? To transport suits from yeah, one. Yeah, right. They, they might have like one gun on their ship, but the, the real purpose is they're just there to get the mobile suits into space and then kind of just wait in the back. Right. But yeah, oft, oftentimes, even in the UC, it, it's like, 
well, we, we put all our money into these space fascist battleships and <laughs> they can carry a few mobile suits, but they have a ton of weapons. And what happens? One mobile suit, usually the Gundam, can take them out in one shot. Yes. You know, so it's it's very much a case of, well, we really should just get carriers. You know, they can even be unarmed. The mobile suits are their arms and their weapons. Yeah. You know, so I, I would completely understand if we transition more to that in our space battles. That'd be interesting. What if going forward, maybe in the future, there's some, they still have a ship, you know, there's still the white base, but it's mostly automated. Cause you know, you, you need all those people right now on the ship to do maintenance, cook and clean and do all that stuff. But if you had automated a lot of that, you could cut down on the number of people that are on that white base as a sitting duck. Yeah, that's true. You'd, it would essentially be just, I guess the tactical leadership in like a, a bridge in the center of it. Yeah. Exactly. Just kind of bunkered away. Okay, that'd be interesting. And then like pilot quarters, and that's about it. The yeah. the machines and robots just do everything else, and you, you don't have to worry about it. A lonely existence, and perhaps less to do on the ship. Maybe that's why they don't do it. But okay, next trope: child soldiers. A majority of the characters across the franchise, protagonists and antagonists, were teenagers when they started their careers as mobile suit pilots. I don't think this is necessarily a problem as long as you don't overuse it. Yeah, it it almost goes hand in hand with, you know, falling into the cockpit. It's because it's always someone young. Right. I I wonder what a a series about someone old and like retired falling into the cockpit would even be like. That could be fun. (laughs) It's someone old enough that like they kind of remember this technology and their experience and they're like, okay, I I guess I'll fight these guys, you know. What if this is his second time falling into the cockpit and the second time he does it in the series, he goes, not again. (laughs) Yeah, on my back. It's like, uh, I, I used to be faster, but ever since my joints started going. Uh, <laughs> the child soldier thing, like, they turned the dial up to 11 for Iron-Blooded Orphans, where it was only child soldiers fighting. Right. Yes. <laughs> but, yeah, I think for the most part, it, it kind of works in Gundam setting. Gundam has been very anti-war and very quick to show the horrors of how horrible war is. And part of that is young people fighting when they probably shouldn't be fighting. I think it's something that's, if done well, it's good to be part of Gundam. I agree. Next one, conservation of ninjutsu, which is one that you mentioned on the previous podcast. Uh-huh. This is where a single enemy in a new mobile suit is usually far more dangerous than a swarm of them attacking at once, even if it's the exact same model. Yeah, that's that's interesting. <laughs> I, I do think that's a problem. I think it's a problem if it's not properly explained. And I think the only way to fix it is better writing. Yeah, yeah, or... um. How do you how do you worm your way out of it? You say the first one was like piloted by the ace, right? And then everything else is piloted by just the kind of grunt pilots. You know, they got new mobile suits, but they're still average Joes. Yeah, you say the first one was piloted by an ace, or at least the first time you didn't know what what you were up against, and then you sort of learned from it, and, and you know how to beat them going forward, or something like that. But I do I think that becomes a problem, especially later in the series where they're just wiping them out with no thought, just oh, just yeah. shoot over there and they blow up immediately. Whereas like. You know, they took a whole episode to defeat before, so. Yeah, you, you can kind of hand wave it by, like, making the first one, like, a really advanced prototype, and then, essentially, the Gundam GM situation, and then the mass-produced ones that they give to the grunts are just somewhat downgraded versions that they just had to streamline. Next trope is called Corporal Punishment, and there's also a similar one called the Bright Slap, which uh, <laughs> is, has been renamed Get a Hold of Yourself, man. They go hand in hand. <laughs> yeah, oh, yay. <laughs> to put a smacking sound in there. Zing. (laughs) So corporal punishment is the main character usually ends up on the wrong end of a punitive beatdown at least once. And that's not even counting the therapeutic beatdowns he's also likely to receive. And then get a hold of yourself, man, is where Bright Noah, the team dad of the UC timeline, is the king of this trope. So much so that it was originally called the Bright Slap, used in several other timelines as well. I don't see it as a problem. I, I think it is maybe a little out of place in today's world, but I don't really see it as a problem. Yeah. I mean, it happens rare enough that like we're a little surprised when we see it. And yeah. also in, in some series, it's hard to tell who's going to get slapped. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Like sometimes no one's safe. <laughs> right. Yes. You know, sometimes you're watching you're like, oh, my God, really? <laughs> I would have loved it if someone would have slapped half the seed destiny cast. Oh, wow. Well, which one's mainly? Well, uh, Atherin. Atherin, definitely. Kagali. Yeah, he needed a good slap. I think Shin needed a, a few good slaps. Yeah. Ray, probably, too. Kira? Yeah, you give Kira one. He's, you know. 
<laughs> he hasn't gotten slapped in a while. Cap- Captain Brian just walking around backhanding everybody <laughs> on the bridge. <laughs> I'm going to hand out bright slaps like they're candy. Yeah. This is why you need to join <laughs> Zeon or, or or whatever faction I'm with because there's there's really no hitting. Like we're busy doing atrocities. <laughs> No, it's, yeah, it's totally different, right? Like, Shiva yeah. created that, that wonderful environment where they didn't have to tuck their shirts in. They could didn't have to wear undershirts. <laughs> they put a painting. Someone, someone <laughs> yeah. made a painting, and they put it on the bridge because they liked it so much. <laughs> a tiger rug. It's very easy going over there. The Federation is all just, you know, beat down. Yeah, definitely, man. Okay, okay. Oh, uh, not to run off on a, a trope tangent, Brian, but do you agree that Bright's the team dad? At least, well. I think so, yeah. As things went on in the UC, and yeah. he was like joined at the hip with whoever was piloting a Gundam, but I would say in the original series he was kind of more the team big brother. Well, yeah, he's the, you know he's the teenage dad in in, okay. in the first one, not knowing <laughs> what the hell he's doing. Dad. Yeah, he's, he's out of his depth. <laughs> yeah, he's you know he's, he's thrown into the world of newborns, and he's not getting a lot of sleep, and think life's hard, yeah. you know. Good thing there's a chef that can bring him fresh burgers, though. <laughs> Straight to the bridge. <laughs> Keeps his salt levels regular. There you go. <laughs> All right, next trope is called Cosmetically Advanced Prequel. And this is where new works set in early time periods, like Thunderbolt and The Origin, both set in the same period as the original Mobile Suit Gundam, but made decades later, tend to include more modern-looking technology. And I don't think that's a problem. That's just the reality of, like, life. I mean, you know, one was 30 years ago. The, the, of course the new one's going to look better. Yeah, that kind of goes for any sci-fi series or any series in general. Like the pre- the prequel that comes out, the the side cool, whatever, you know, years later, we go along with it. We just kind of nod our heads and we're like, all right, you know, some of the characters are, that they brought back, the actors gotten a little older, but we're going to pretend yeah. that this is, you know, six years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we just kind of nod and enjoy the story. We, we willfully go into the suspension of disbelief. And yep. something forgiving about anime and hopefully Gundam is that they can just give a facelift to past series and then do them again. You know, like, well, we, we're hoping still that we see uh, the original series just redone in, in incredible technical glory. And it'll it'll mesh seamlessly, I think, with any series that came out that was a side story or a prequel. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a positive. I think it reinvigorates the old material absolutely yeah i'm all for that one yeah don't change next one is called crap sack world the various gundam settings are usually not pleasant places to live <laughs> involving mass murder on the scales of millions or billions of people at a time and the risk of humanity driving itself entirely to extinction the only good news is the protagonists are usually able to prevent complete disaster again i don't think this is a problem i agree that it's common but that's just kind of like the gundam thing like that's our approach here isaac that that's just gundam to me yeah, I I double down and say it's not even really a threat because going back to the colony drop thing, we we know the villains aren't going to wipe out Earth. Like even if they got away with the operation to drop something on Earth, the Earth is still going to be there, and you know people life will go on. And the whole setting itself has to be a warlike setting, usually kicked off with a mass amount of death by the villains. <laughs> but but that's just that's Gundam. That's our setting. You know, we we can't have Star Wars without war. We can't have Gundams without space conflict. You, you know, we can't have a, a Game of Thrones without you know political intrigue and dragons roasting people and armies moving around. And this is how our, our different settings work, and it works. Next one is called Cyber Cyclops. The bad guy mobile suits tend to have a single glowing camera. They're typically referred to as mono eyes. Ooh. Does it bother you that they're always the bad guy, Isaac? Should they switch it up and maybe the mono eyes are the good guys someday? I would think that'd be very interesting to see. But at the same time, I think if I saw a good team of like mono eyes backing up a Gundam, I'd be very curious like visually what the animators decided to go with for the new villains. Like what bizarre optical sensors are they going to have where we look at them and the audience knows that they're villains. Like, if the mono is good, what pulsating, <laughs> globular, you know, <laughs> snake eye is is going to be on the top of the mobile suit for the villains? <laughs> It'll just be the the Leo's ugly big like visor thing. Oh yeah, that the faceless little little yeah the the vi- yeah, the, 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 the rectangle <laughs> the square television yeah yes. the the nineteen nineties television <laughs> the Arnim Zola of mobile suits. 
Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I almost feel like the mono Y is better kept in the UC. Mm, yeah. But at the same time, I don't think I'd be opposed to seeing it in other universes. Um, I thought it was done very well in uh, After War Gundam X because yeah. it was always behind like that kind of grill that those mobile suits had. But what I wouldn't want to see, and we all can agree on this, is copy and pasting a UC mobile suit like we saw in Gundam Seed. Uh yes, yeah. That was just unacceptable. You know, it was like <laughs> it was like really like you couldn't even come up with your original designs and just use mono eyes. You you took the whole mobile suit, you know. <laughs> that was Isaac line, like we found it everyone. And yeah, and see Destiny stepped over it. Yeah. You you crossed a line. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is called Doomed Hometown. The main ah. character's hometown, frequently a space colony, is usually wrecked early in the series sometimes directly leads to falling into the cockpit. Wow. I do think this maybe is a little bit of a problem if you do it too much. I think maybe a good way to fix it would be their hometown is fine up until maybe the end of the series, and then it gets wrecked. Yeah, that's that's a perfect way to put it. In fact, they've done it so much that as fans, if like episode one ended with falling into the cockpit, but they save the colony and like fight off the fascists, then I'd be like, wow, I didn't see this coming. <laughs> <laughs> It would be like a two-layer surprise, right? Number one, yeah. that they fought them off, and then uh, and instead of like, you know having to evacuate because the, the colony's punched with holes, and number two, yeah. it'd be like okay, in this setting, you know, the engineers have really paid attention to past wars, and these colonies can really stand a lot of damage. Like you, you know, you don't have to run for your life if there's a war. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I, I think they just need to make it mean something on the back end of the show instead of the front end. Because right now they're always using it to like get the kid in the cockpit. Yeah. But if, if maybe he was already in there and maybe he was cocky and then all of a sudden his hometown got wrecked at the end, it, it would be a different impact. I don't know. They just need to change it up, I guess. I'm just saying they shouldn't always blow up the hometown at the beginning. Right, yeah. And it would show the Bulbasuit's Suit's power, the Gundam's power, if it was really able to defend the colony. You know, the colony right. took minimal damage or or if it did take a moderate amount of damage not to the point where it, it, it's essentially done you right. know it's it's totaled and all the air is leaving and everyone's either dead or they if they got in a shuttle they escaped all right next one isaac is called the federation and this is basically just how a lot of <laughs> series have this sort of big monolithic united earth government is right. that a problem is that too generic um i think maybe if you do it too much yeah this one, I'm going to kind of give a cop-out answer, but it it depends. It depends how it's done. It depends how it's done well in the story. Definitely what faction they're fighting. Maybe they're fighting multiple factions. Yeah. But I, I feel like the whole Federation idea was sort of, you know, dissected or, or countered and was done very well was in Gundam Seed, where we had the Earth Alliance. And, mm. you know, initially you're like, okay, they're the Federation. And then more episodes go by and you're like, oh, wow, this... This organization is really divided within itself. You know, you, you got the Atlantic Alliance, which are pretty evil, or at least controlled by evil people. And then, um, you know, other factions that were clearly more tolerant with um, coordinators, and they clearly had much more free societies or open societies. So, yeah, I, I thought that was a, a much more interesting way to uh, really show that the Earth is very vast. And even if it was you know, one monolithic federation, upon closer inspection, there's a lot more factions, factions involved. Yeah, I think it's also just a simple way to simplify your story if you're the author, right? If you're trying to create a series about Earth versus space conflict, having multiple Earth factions, it just makes your story more difficult to write around. And so that's probably why that happens frequently, in my opinion. Yeah. And oftentimes, you know, we got we got 50 episodes. We have to do a story. We got the bad guys in space. We got the good guys. And we need, you know, one solid, vaguely good faction, mostly good faction. Next one is called Grand Theft Prototype. Gundam was actually the original namer of this trope. It used to be called Gundam Jack, and they only renamed it Grand Theft Prototype. Um, but basically, highly advanced Gundams featuring experimental technology and, and high combat performance get stolen with alarming regularity in the franchise. <laughs> Do you think we've stolen too many prototypes, Isaac? Um, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Yeah, not even like, yeah, it just, it, just uh, it, it begs the question, like how in all these universes, there's just such poor security around these all powerful weapons that usually decide the course of a war. Yeah. So I, I completely agree. This is something that needs to be changed. Let's just stop stealing them. 
you know, let's let's just stop. Yeah, and I think an easy way to do this is just instead of stealing them, I think we need more like we saw in Double Eighty Three with Shima, where she went and actually just bargained for you know Unit Four, and like they gave it to her, or like yeah. in Hathaway when when Anaheim plays both sides and creates both the Penelope and the Kasai Gundam. So there, there's ways around it to get the the prototype into the bad guy hands without necessarily stealing it. Yeah, like stealing sounds like such a risk because if you're caught, it could lead to war. But if you don't pull it off, you get killed, and then you <laughs> well, still Isaac. There's no risk when there's no locks in the doors and there's no one guarding the base. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's true. But um, the way around it, of course, where you don't really need to steal at all is, as, as Shima and uh, Mafti showed us, just corruption, straight up corruption. Yep. <laughs> just pay them off and you're, you're good. Yeah, it's, it's like, why steal something if we can just buy it? You know? yeah. Just pay your next day shipping and you're good. Uh, you'll love this one, Isaac. Gratuitous Princess. Gundam X oh. and Age are the only TV series that are totally devoid of a princess or a princess in exile or the daughter of an important official be it government or scientists, in a major and or supporting role. And it's not uncommon for said character to be the love interest for a major character either. Uh, I agree with that. I think we probably have too many princesses. Yeah, I'd almost say it's a legacy of the time period from the original series where Disney was very big, princesses, of course, were mandatory. That type of hold over animation always had a princess, It's part of the story. It's part of the formula. So, of course, Gundam should have it. It was very common in other anime also. But, yeah, I think it's time has come. If anything, (laughs) maybe we should turn it on its head and there'll be a prince. Oh, look at that. (laughs) There'll there'll be a prince in the next one. And the rugged uh, heroine is the Gundam pilot. The prince is very posh and spoiled and not, not very worldly. And, you know, who's got to save the prince? It's the, it's the, the Gundam pilot. Yeah, maybe Suleta's going to bag herself a prince. Yeah, maybe. You know, we'll find out. Uh, this one's also for you, Isaac. There was two. Uh, this one's called Hover Skates, and there was another one called Bell Bottom Suits. <laughs> <laughs> mecha can often move this way, even if they can't out and outfly with their thrusters. Some mecha are explicitly designed for it, most notably the Dom from various Universal Century works. And then the Bell Bottom one was talking about how, for some reason, the lower legs are like bigger than they should be. I don't think this podcast will ever have a, a problem with hover skates or big thick legs. No, no. And anyone who thinks so, let me just say, tell you that like, <laughs> if you do, I feel personally attacked. <laughs> because they're amazing. You know, if you think about it, the wider surface area means there's more lift off the ground <laughs> from the, the vents and the, the VTOL system in their feet. It lifts them <laughs> off the ground, and then they can propel themselves any way they want. It's pretty brilliant if you think about it, you know. <laughs> and all it that just coming works. from an English major for, or a history major, folks. Yeah, there you go. And it works. All right, it works. <laughs> uh, here's one, gray and gray morality. Gundam is notable for rarely portraying either side as faceless, mindless evildoers. There are good people and bad people on all sides. That said, the protagonist faction will usually be a lighter shade of gray. Yeah, I would even go a step further and say the protagonist faction, nine times out of ten, is light gray. And the villain faction, which is almost always space fascists, they're charcoal. (laughs) (laughs) The only reason they're not like full, completely, you know, night black is because, or what's what's that one shade of black that's like super dark, Vanta black or something like that? Yeah, Mocus black or something like that. Whatever, yeah, no light escapes it. The only reason they're not that is usually because of like a handful of officers that are pretty humane and honorable, you know, that for whatever reason, just a random chance of birth, they happen to be born in like the the space fascist colony. So they're like, they go along with it. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, I think we've, we've talked a lot about this on the podcast various times about how the Federation is the, you know, quote, the good guy, but all the Federation officials that we're presented with are generally terrible the Xeon are the bad guy, but generally all the Xeon officers we see are more noble and you, you kind of like them. So it's just this weird juxtaposition, I guess. At this, but at the same time, Xeon is the one drop in the colony, right? So there you go. Yeah, yeah. And there's your charcoal. And it's not the charcoal after it's been on the, the grill for a while, right? It's, you're talking the charcoal as it right when you put it on. Here's one. Info dump. Happens in some spots, such as the introduction of the specials in Gundam Wing. I think this could be a problem, and that's just bad writing. I don't think it's a Gundam thing, necessarily. If your episode gets too dragged down with an info dump, that's your own fault. For example, I think the 
the Witch from Mercury prologue was great in that respect. They dumped a lot of info on you, but you didn't feel like you were getting an info dump. Yeah, I'm trying to think. What series does it poorly? I think C does it poorly when they go in the coordinator thing and they just spend all this time about how, oh, by the way, you know, you're special and we're all in this lab and I had two projects. One was Rao and he was the practice one oh. and you were the better one. And it was just like, what? Yeah. or the, the, You mean kind of the shootout episode, right? Where like Rao, yeah. Mu, and Kira were at the, the remnants of the lab. Randomly. that They just stumbled upon, by the way. Yeah. And this is like three episodes before the final battle. Yes. And... <laughs> And Rao gives like a 20 minute speech. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that really did feel out of place. It kind of broke like the pacing, you know, that it yeah. almost felt like this should have happened at like the midway point or something. Yeah, or just gradually, you know, you, at that point you had 47 other chances to do it and you waited until like episode 48 or whatever it was. Yeah. You know, you could have spaced it out a bit, but whoever left the remnants of that lab, like they kind of did a bad job because there's a lot <laughs> still there. <laughs> no, they literally got up and left. It didn't look like anyone had cleaned up at all. Yeah, you should have burned it to the ground or something, right? You Probably smelled horrible. There's a yeah. lot of evidence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next one is latex spacesuit for both uh, males and females, you, the only pilots. Other crew members get bulkier and more conventional spacesuits. Also downplayed is is that pilot suits more closely resemble advanced flight suits rather than being skin tight. I've always wondered, like, how do they get enough shielding into those uh, normal suits, Isaac? Uh, you mean specifically for, like, radiation shielding or something yeah, like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Advancements in technology, Brian. Just yeah. The thinnest radiation shielding can be put into fabric. <laughs> you know, it, it's one of the layers in their normal suits. Yeah, it's, it's probably from the Minofsky particle. Oh, of course. Uh, we all know the Minoski particles, they, they increase human survivability in space by reducing exposure to radioactive waves. Let's see. How about love across battle lines? A staple of the series, part of the standard love hurts Aesop. Psychic powers leading to characters to bond instantly helps or rather hurts. Do you, are you sick of like love stories across battle lines? I mean, that's, I don't think that's unique to Gundam. They do use it a bit. I think in general it's done okay. Yeah, I almost feel like it's a good part of Gundam, even though we see it very frequently, because a lot of, dare I say, Gundam's core message actually really is reduced to war is bad. And why is it bad? Not just the loss of life, but just the whole, the the tragedy that people who should be allowed to love each other in peace and have lives together are just forced to either fight each other directly or they're on opposite sides of the war. Yes, agreed. Agreed. Yeah, the, the tragedy of humanity and our ongoing addiction or cycle of war. How about made of indestructium? Gundams are typically made of this, whether it's Gundarium in the universe century, Gundanium in the after colony century. The, in Double uh, O, they use GN composite armor, which is you know, <laughs> which is just normal armor reinforced with another trope, which they called applied phlebotium, phlebotanum. <laughs> Cosmic era used phase shift armor. I don't mind this, Isaac. I mean, the Gundams have to be special in some way, but I, I could see why people don't like it. Yeah, we need it because the Gundam has to make it to the end of the series. Right. And, well, I mean, you could do like the Midway Destroy Point and then like it's replaced by another Gundam, but uh, nine times out of ten, the Gundam's made out of something that most other mobile suits aren't, and that always increases its survivability. So this is something that's part of Gundam and something that's needed for the stories to progress nine times out of ten. But but I, I do sort of agree where a lot of people, maybe even in earlier series, are watching and they're like, what's the point in attacking the Gundam if you're a mono eye? The bullets are going to bounce off. <laughs> you're going to die. It's faster than you. You know, just get out of there. J j right. Yeah, just request a nuclear strike or something. Especially in Wing, right? You yeah. Know, like, those battles felt very pointless. Yeah. Those suits weren't going down. Absolutely. That that might have been the worst showing of cannon fodder mobile suits. But 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 yeah, I, I think when, when done well or the standard way, it works. When done poorly, Gundam Wing style, it's, it's absolute trash. <laughs> uh, the opposite of this, Isaac, is called made of explodium, which is frequently what mook mecha are made out of. <laughs> oh, yeah. Given that an actual explanation that you see works, Minofsky reactor breached by beam weaponry will likely go nuclear, but other series use it as well. Gundam Wing uh, and its classic mecha mook the Leo are most infamous for it. I mean, I don't know. I love my big explosions when the bad guy blows up. They play fast and loose with that, too, sometimes, right, Isaac? I mean, oh. sometimes they go nuclear and sometimes they don't, and it's never really clear. 
and and Brian, you took the words out of my mouth because we know in the cosmic era, if you're fighting Kira Yamato, <laughs> he can shoot you in the arm or leg or even the the head of your mobile suit and you'll be fine. You'll be out of commission for the battle, right? Yeah. But God help you if somebody else shoots your arm or your leg or your head because your whole mobile suit would explode, killing you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So. It's just it's so weird that like he can do it so accurately. I don't really know that he's doing it. Isn't it just the targeting computer? They just need someone to sit in the suit and turn on the computer and hit go. It doesn't matter, Brian, because he's Kira Jesus Yamato. <laughs> Gundam Seed yeah. Destiny is the second coming of Kira Yamato. He's probably targeting my house right now. Probably, but you know what? No one will die. He'll just shoot the arm off your house. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, he'll take away my garage door and my front door and my windows. But yep. yeah, Now you can't fight the battle. <laughs> there you go. Militaries are useless. In numerous Gundam series, the military units are composed of weaker grunt mobile suits that are largely ineffective and destroyed in large numbers by the much more powerful Gundams and other hero mechs, which are always piloted by main characters. The grunt mobile hmm. suits are always piloted by characters who don't have major narrative roles, assuming they're even seen at all. Hmm, interesting. I would say this definitely varies. We don't see this that often. You know, like o- Odessa was 99.9% the type 63s the gms you know the the federation air force the gundam had its role kind of in saving the day really but not in like the whole success of the operation so i i I think the militaries do have roles especially if we're doing like a sweeping war across the whole earth sphere but but yeah i do agree that the mook and cannon fodder grunt mobile suits are on both sides yeah i think if you as long as you have them on both sides i think it's fine yeah that's why it works in UC. But like in Wing, for example, there was no useless suits on on the good guy side. And so it was always just so overwhelming. Yeah. And it was just uh, ridiculous to the point of they really should have inserted an episode where one alliance general was like, look, I'm not sending, you know, my troops out there to fight. There's no point. We're going to leave. And then the nuclear weapons will go off. Yeah. That's our best chance, really. I'll deal with the paperwork later. Uh, <laughs> so. Oh, how about this one, Isaac? I, I didn't. This this has a fact in there that I didn't I didn't know, and I don't know if this is true. So someone tell me if this is wrong. But this is what's on their website. The trope is called Mook Mobile. Dozens of variants in the franchise, usually limited to two or three examples per series. The bad guys usually have one that's influenced by the original Zaku Two from Mobile Suit Gundam, with the gas mask face and its iconic mono eye. In fact, the word Zaku is even derived from Zako, which means Mook in Japanese. Hmm. Interesting. I would say that at least over the last. 10 years Gundam's moved away from the gas mask mono eye showing up in you know as often as they can yeah so I, I'll give them credit to that they may have even moved away from the mook a little bit in general right um I, no I'll I'll, no. I'll argue I'll argue majority nine times out of ten no we're gonna get a mook on the villains and we're gonna see it fairly frequently to the point that we know it's the mook because it's what we see most of the time fighting the heroes yeah okay I I, I just don't feel like in Iron Blooded Orphans that there was like one mook that was as notable like if you ask me what was the main mook from Iron Blooded Orphans I don't know that I would answer you okay I I agree with you there but if I showed you like a lineup of oh, you know, yeah, the, the, the three main Gallahorn mobile suits that their grunts use, you'd be like, yeah, I remember those ones holding Dane sleeves. Yeah, I remember those ones on the ground fighting a Barbados close-up. You'd be able to kind of feel out, okay, th- this does look like Gallahorn standing army. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Here's a good one. Nuclear option. Notable for averting the nuclear weapons taboo. The UC and CE timelines in particular are fond of throwing nukes around. UC generally treats them as dangerous and powerful, but not necessarily evil, while CE is less is rather less forgiving. My point on that is like I feel like uh, the shows go out of their way to prevent the use of nukes because it would ruin the story. Yeah, and it's almost story specific too. Like when we saw nukes in Universal Century, a beam blast could take them out and then everybody just kind of went on with their day. Yeah. At Odessa, you know, the, the troops weren't panicking at the idea of a nuke hitting them. They were just kind of, you know, well, we'll go on with our day, um, <laughs> especially Rebel. In the Cosmic Era, it's different because Zapt kind of has like this this social trauma 
where, you know, they, they watch one of their colonies. People probably looked out the window and could see it. I imagine some people might have gone blind depending on where they were looking at the explosion. Right. So they've kind of went through a nuke blowing up really right next to them and taking out <laughs> a lot of their people. So it, it depends what setting you're in, what, what how much time has gone by. Uh, in Char's counterattack, there was a point where um, I, I think uh, Neo Zeon launched a barrage of dozens, if not hundreds, of nukes at um, Londo Bell. Well, it might have been Londo Bell firing at Char, wasn't he, too? Oh, maybe it was that. But yeah, I, yeah. I, either way, technology has moved to the point where, at least in UC, they're, they're almost more of a tactical problem, not really something that could, you know, completely decide the course of a battle. Yeah, and, and on the opposite side, I, I feel like in Seed, Jabril, he just loved his nukes. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, that was kind of the Alliance's kind of go-to weapon. Like, if anything, Jabril learned from Asriel that they relied on it too much, right? That's why he built, you know, Nibelung and Requiem, I assume. Oh, they, yeah, They, they wanted their own energy weapon. They were like, well, we're getting our nukes slapped around left and right each time we use them. Like, if, if anybody wants to stop a nuclear attack in the cosmic area, you really just need a pilot with a, you know, a beam rifle and a good shot. Or a neutron stampeder, which came out of nowhere and was only used once. Yeah, you think they would have, if Admiral Isaac was there, he would have said, you know, we don't need to wait and use a neutron stampeder like on our doorstep. Why don't we take <laughs> it, you know, to their fleet when it's actually on the moon and then we use a neutron stampeder. Like, we'll, we'll kill two birds with one stone. Um, <laughs> nope, nope. This is how I think ahead. Um, <laughs> but anyways, yeah, yeah. Okay, here's two. Pink girl, blue boy, and pink means feminine. Oftentimes the Federation has uniforms for each gender with these matching colors which is why so many female pilots from Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam all the way through Gundam Age have pink mobile suits, or at least suits with pink highlights. This goes back to your, like, why are all the women wearing pink and all the boys wearing blue, but then, like, random people get the grays? Well, I think we kind of worked that out, and we, we, we sort of deduced that, like, well, the khaki and gray has to be officers, and then, you know, everyone below that would be, I guess, gender assigned a blue or a pink. Yeah, and I think it's also just a design choice. They're trying to make their characters look interesting yeah ironically i don't think any of the villains usually do that right like everybody gets the same thing i think that might be right doesn't well sometimes it doesn't zeon the females might wear like reddish well reddish really only shima and char are the ones that wear red yeah and kaecilia wore red at some point didn't she or purple well yeah but like i mean her rank like nobody dresses like her she's in well, that's true yeah she's in like loungewear <laughs> there was also the girl who joined uh, the igloo ship she wore red. Oh, yeah. Cadillac. Yeah. I think her name was Cadillac. Yeah. Yeah. She did have her own red uniform. God, that must mean you're some type of forward operating captain or commander or something like that. You know? Okay. Interesting. But yeah, I would say nowadays it's a little dated. Why don't we have everybody in blue? Like giving everybody a gender colored clothes is kind of odd, I think. At least in our real world militaries, to my knowledge... Every country, you know, the major countries and stuff, I don't think you get a gender colored uniform so much as one that's been tailored for your gender, you know, like yeah. uh, the hat that's different, you know, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. This one is, is a big one for me. Poor communication skills. <laughs> Characters frequently end up fighting and killing each other unnecessarily because they aren't able to communicate well enough to realize that neither side actually wants to fight. But just as often, they will establish that communication and end up fighting, killing each other anyway. Even though they didn't want to fight, they still have incompatible ideals and neither side is willing to back down. This is Gundam Wing in a nutshell, Isaac. If they had just talked for 10 minutes all in the same room, it, that we'd, been, we'd avoided the whole show. Yeah, I'd go a step further, too. This is double O in a nutshell, because if Rusta Alien um, talked to, uh, oh God, what's his name? Oh, you mean Iron Blood Orphans? Sorry, yeah, sorry. Iron Blooded Orphans. Oh God, double O. If Iron Blood, <laughs> Rustal Alien talked to um, what was his name? Oh, uh, uh, McGillis. McGillis Farid. They would have kind of solved the way to transition Galahorn into democracy, like over dinner, you know, over like yeah. a, a two-day meeting with notes. Yeah, so much could have been avoided with communication. And this applies even within factions, like the Federation communicating with its own grunts on the ground or or Xeon communicating with its, its troops on the front. It, so much, as usual, even in our real world, could have been avoided with uh, just better communication. 
Yeah, and Rastal would have uh, went and you know killed or arrested his abuser, which he did anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean he did uh, for political reasons. Foster but... father was yeah was was excommunicated anyway, so he would he would have entertained that. I mean, it would have been interesting. Maybe they wouldn't have seen exactly eye to eye, but I think you're right. I think they would have avoided at least a large part of that conflict. Yeah, yeah, it's just it didn't happen, Brian. <laughs> Here's one for you, Isaac: the remnant. Exaggerated in the Universal Century continuity, the Principality of Zeon is defeated in the One Year War, but the various Neo Zeon factions continue to be the standard villain, even for most later uh, UC series, with their last holdouts only falling in uh, UC 0123, referring to Mars Zeon. Uh, Unicorn's adversaries get bonus points for being the remnant of another remnant. Do we have too many remnants, Isaac? I would definitely say the Neo Zeon problem in UC is pretty bad. But that's really only where we see it. I don't think we see it too much in other series where it's just, you know, Neo's aft or, you know, Neo, Neo Mars and all that. So it's, it's something that's kind of been quarantined to the UC, I think. Do you agree with me? Do you, where, where's this remnant in other series? I think it's mainly in UC for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there hasn't been enough s- multiple series in the same timeline to really have remnants in the other timelines. Exactly. Yeah, but um, I, it's quarantined to like three or four decades in UC. So if if you're sick of Neo Zeon, you're in luck because the UC timeline does move on. <laughs> All right, two last ones, Isaac. One is uh, standard sci-fi history, uh, and this is basically just saying that Gundam follows like the standard sci-fi history pattern of development for humans which is like you know you start out exploring space and then you start out and then you have a war and then you explore deeper space and then eventually you move out to another galaxy and then you uh, make contact with aliens and then you you know eventually you you ascend to a higher plane of existence and uh, I don't think that's really a negative I just think that's that it's it's standard sci-fi history because that's how it would work yeah, I like you have to you have to go to small space before you go to big space. Like I don't see that as a negative per se. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I'd go a step further and say it's very much telling the story of humanity. It, we we spread across the world. We found you know sometimes other humans in different areas. And uh, what do humans do? We we fight. You know we have peace yeah. and war and fight. And uh, why why would space be any different? Why would humans in space be any different? We would take all the good and the bad of humanity out into space with us. We fight, and there'll be peace in space also, but there'll also be times of war and, you know, love and tragedy and everything else. So Gundam is very much telling the 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 space opera tropes of humanity being among the stars, but we very much still have all of our all of that's good about us and all of the, that's horrible about us. All right, last one. Trailers always spoil. A number of episode trailers and sometimes the titles center around an event that happens in the last couple minutes of the episode. Isaac, in Sea Destiny, this was rampant. Every time we got a new opening, it spoiled all the new mobile suits coming up that had not been revealed yet. I hated that. They need to stop that. (laughs) I I guess I kind of agree. To an extent, you can remedy it by skipping the intro. but (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, I'm like, well they're thinking we need this new intro to spoil things or not spoil things, but show things that will become standard after they're revealed. So new character, new mobile suit, new ship, you know, a possible battle location, things like that. So they're, they're kind of thinking ahead, but by doing that, they have to tip their hat. I just think it's a, it's a bummer for you as the viewer. If your first time watching it, you're like, Oh, well clearly Kira is going to get the, you know, a new freedom Gundam. You didn't yeah. know that going in, but um, maybe that's just me. So, eh, minor problem. All right, I think that was a long list of tropes, and I think we even only covered probably a, a quarter of the ones on TV tropes, if not less. So, listeners, let us know what your favorite Gundam tropes are. Which ones you like? Which ones you you hate? You you can't wait to see stamped out. Let us know your thoughts on the shark clones, colony drops, or any anything you want to call out, Isaac. Yeah, let us. I mean, if there's a trope that's kind of bugging you, let us know how you'd. You, how are you envisioning turning it on its head you know subverting it countering it something like that freshening it up yeah and let us know your reasons why people would wear masks like char in your life <laughs> and what your mask would look like <laughs> no one no one would get away with it 
like at a certain <laughs> there's no way like you have to be so high in like you know government authority or society to just get away with it actually the only way you could get away with it would be like you're a musician you're an artist you know mm. there's no way you're gonna get away with it in the military or the government <laughs> yeah i mean you have to be like in a secret society or the entire uh story needs to take place on halloween yeah yeah that's a good point yeah. <laughs> halloween. <laughs> gundam halloween that sounds pretty fun <laughs> coming soon Ooh, to yeah. a colony drop podcast near you <laughs> gundam jack-o-lantern oh 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 <laughs> you spoiled Zing. it isaac <laughs> You hit the trope. You spoiled it oh, in the trailer. No. <laughs> All right, Isaac, take us away. All right, listeners, before you go to sleep tonight, stand next to your bed. Get on your knees. Put your hands together. Look up at the ceiling. And hail Zeon. Good night, everybody. <laughs>